I'm Zach. Nice to be here. Uh, this is actually the podcast that Dr. Tim was mentioning. It's called Evolution 101. Um, it's available at iTunes. If you go to the podcast director there, they have it. Um, also, my website, drzach.net, and then you, you can also find it several different podcast directories. And there's the uh, logo for that. So today I wanted to, uh, since the sort of the, the topic at large is changes, uh, so speciation and how do species change from one to another and, and how do we even tell what uh, one species is versus another one? And this is actually um, quite a vexing question for evolution and um, sort of like in a philosophical way and I'm going to be covering this actually later this week at the Dallas Philosophers Forum. Now, so I wanted to talk about what is a species because you sort of, you know, a cat is a cat, a dog is a dog. It seems like something that's just sort of intuitive, but it actually is, is really not quite that. Um, Darwin's thesis on evolutionary theory, of course, uh, was titled on the origin of species. And so sort of, you know, you, you presume a clear understanding of what this concept is, this, this term species that we talk about. But like most aspects of science, most things that we deal with, it is actually is a lot more complex than that. Um, so how do we distinguish one species from another? You know, I mean, you just, you look at a cat, you look at a dog, you say, okay, these are obviously different species, but, you know, how do you really, you know, rationally go about this process? And it actually is quite difficult. And um, there's not quite a clear answer yet. One good way to do it is typology, and this is sort of the, uh, the initial way that things were done. The next is morphometry, and I'll, I'll get into these in detail later. Um, there's also the concept of sexual isolation. Uh, and finally, we can look at phylogeny, how these organisms are related to each other. So typology, uh, like I said, is one of the earliest ways that um, species were distinguished, things were classified. If you go all the way back to Carl von Linné, uh, Linnaeus, you know, he invented this uh, binomial taxonomy system. Um, and the way it worked is you would actually find um, a, a, the first novel individual of, of any group, something new, something that's not been seen before, and you would bring that into a laboratory or a museum or something like that, and that would be the prototype or the type, and I put that in quotes because that's what they would call it, the type specimen. And then when you go out in the field and you find other organisms that are similar to that original type specimen, then you say, well, okay, well, this looks like this thing that we have in a drawer someplace, so it belongs to that same species. The problem with this is that this way of classifying things assumes that all members of a species are going to have all the same characteristics, and you can't actually take them and put them next to each other and compare them and say, well, this looks exactly like that, so they have to be related. Um, but that is not true. Uh, there's a wide uh, amount of variability among different species, and we know that you can find different organisms in, in a species that don't look anything like each other. Uh, this is an example. Uh, on the left, you see um, literally butterflies pinned down to a board in a drawer someplace, and this is the way it works. You can go to any museum, and they've got type specimens in drawers, just shelves and shelves and shelves of dead animals or plants. Uh, they've got books and books of plants that are sort of pressed down into the pages and bound down there, and they, those are the type specimens, and you literally do keep those in a drawer someplace and compare other organisms out in the field to what you have in your book back in the museum. So it's not really the optimal way to do things. The other way to look at things is by comparing morphometry. Morphometry means uh, measuring of different you know, physical characteristics. So the idea of this is that all members of a particular species will share certain physical characteristics. Of course, this seems intuitive also. Um, the difference of this is that it does not use a type specimen. You don't have, you know, whatever the first thing is that you find, bring it to the museum and compare everything else to that. You look at the entire population and you compare, you know, the physical features of each one of those. And the individuals are then grouped together by the way that they look. There's a problem with this, though. Genetic studies have shown that organisms can look very, very similar without actually being closely related. Uh, several good examples of this, for example, the, um, the flying fox, the large fruit bat. Um, their genetic studies suggest that it's actually probably a primate and not a bat, even though it looks just like a bat. Um, here's an ex uh, some more examples of this. On the left, you see um, crania of uh, various hominid 
species all put together and compared, and you can sort of you can pick out the species, you can divide them into different species based on the way their skulls look. On the right, you see examples of fish skin. You can classify different species based on the type of scales and the size of the scales that they have. Um, sexual isolation is something that you're probably a little bit more familiar with. Um, this is back in the 40s and 50s. Ernst Mayer, you know, the, the great evolutionary biologist, started talking about the definition of a species as something that, you know, which cannot interbreed with something else that's different. Um, so the, the sort of the working definition for this classification is that all members of the species are able to interbreed. And what happens is you have some sort of a geographical or other barrier um, that separates members of the population and keeps them separate long enough so that they are able to change in some way that prevents them from interbreeding. And so then you have that sexual barrier which prevents them from sharing genes and they further speciate. Um, and so you get eventual uh, sexual incompatibility. The problem with this is that we know there are several different species that we know of that are actually able to hybridize. They are actually able to uh, have sex with each other and generate young. And uh, there are many species that do this that we know of. Now, there's another problem. Uh, not all species are sexual. There's a vast number of asexual organisms, um, you know, bacteria, for example, and the most populous organism on this planet completely asexual, so how do you classify them if they're not actually, you know, exchanging genes with each other? And uh, here's some examples. On the left you see the liger, uh, Napoleon Dynamite's favorite animal. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you see how, this is actually kind of interesting as an aside, you see how massive this creature is. This is a full-grown man it's standing next to. It actually turns out that there is, in, in the lion side of its DNA, there is actually uh, a growth factor that's expressed that causes growth, and on the tiger's Y chromosome, uh, or in the lion's Y chromosome, there's a repressor that keeps that from getting too big, but the tigers do not have that. So when the lion crosses with the tiger, there's no check for that growth, and these animals get huge, as big as horses. It's amazing. Um, on the right side, you see uh, some whiptail lizards, and these are actually asexual creatures. These are all female. They reproduced by what's known as parthenogenesis, and there's a number of lizard species that do that. Actually, we, we just found out a few weeks ago um, that the, uh, the big Komodo dragons actually do the same thing. And so they're, they're, you don't need a male to actually reproduce. They can just give birth. It's a miracle. Um, <laughs> um, so the other way to do 